I want people to become part of the solution by becoming more informed. So part of this show is just listening to the story of the offender and learning from that one experience. But the more important goal of the show is to educate the community. Together we can make a difference. And I think watching the show is where it starts. Yeah, What's going on sexually at this time in your life, uh, say in the service? As well, I in the service, I started getting into probably pornography at that point. Go back a little bit when I was in high school, you know, it's kind of sort of back to kind of the boundary issue type of a deal, but I got some respect and I had a car and I had a job um, that I started gaining a little bit of favor with the, the younger, because the school I went to was oddly, this is like would never happen today, 7th through 12th, right? And some of the younger girls, they thought I was pretty much it because here I am, an older boy, I got a car, I got a little bit of money, I'm a, you know, a notable person. and. And so I started gaining a little bit more success there. I mean, I never ever ended up in anything sexual, but at least they gave me some respect and some attention. So that became a fascination through probably my mid-20s where I was still young. I'm a small man. I look young, right, that they were more attracted to me than, uh, but I was still very inept. And okay. More attracted than the girls your own age. Right, because they really were less interested in me because I think I had less to offer. They thought I was clumsy with them, where I had more confidence with the others. So the boundaries started moving backwards a little bit. And the first time you ever had sex, you were how old? I was probably 17. Okay. And then you end up getting married to your wife. Mm-hmm. And Well, most of us do, right? Mm -hmm. end, end up getting married to, to our wives. To our wives, yes. Yeah. So you, you ended up getting married. And... Uh, Things are going pretty well. You've got the good in-laws. You've got a job. So what happens What happens next to get you on this path toward downloading child pornography? Uh, it's just going back to something that gave me pleasure. I think it was something that gave me pleasure, drinking and karaoke, and that was about the only thing that was actually pleasurable in my life. Uh, it was something I didn't seek. Or it was a fantasy. Uh, it just gave me pleasure, and I think that I started that. I had the opportunity because I already had the fantasies from before, and then the internet, getting connected to that, gave me the opportunity. I, I just didn't really see any conflict. I just didn't see if myself I was actually hurting anybody at the time. It was just something that I was, I was doing. I mean, the pictures were out there, they were free, and I, this was the things that was going on in my mind at the time, and I wasn't, you know, I'm not really, I justified myself a million ways. Not, not justifiably, but I did justify myself in a million ways of doing this, and so I collected this stuff. You know, you, you actually raised the question, so what's your thinking now? I mean, do you think, child, do you think looking at child pornography does any harm to anybody? Well, I mean, it does harm, well, it does harm to me, and I really think that it promotes that interest on, from people that are making money off of that, even mm -hmm. though I wouldn't, and I didn't give any money then. But it's like, it still promotes, they're having, uh, they're having visitors and, and things like that, so that adds to their profile, so that brings them up and makes them easier to find. Uh, so it's overall, you know, in a sort of an oblique way, it, it's 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 very it's not positive. Would you say supportive of the industry? Supportive of the industry, yeah. Hey, um, you end up one day looking at some chi photographs of children. Did you start with pornography, or did you start with just pictures of children? Just pictures. It evolved into pornography, and uh, child pornography, that is. And then uh, how, how many months or years was that going on before your wife found the stuff? I don't know, probably a year and a half, two okay. years. So about 18 months, your wife, she finds this stuff. Now, back in those days, your backyard looked out into a schoolyard? Or? Yeah, across, the, across my in-law's property over to the playground area of, of a schoolyard. Would you be watching the children... No, I mean, there was no opportunity. Actually, there was one narrow little window. The the bedroom window that faced that had opaque on it. Um, it was really quite a distance. Oh, okay. So it wasn't like you were getting out the telescope and the no. binoculars trying no. to get a better view. All right, so 18 months ago, your wife finds this stuff. What's her reaction? 
Well, I, the first reaction was her f her friend with her, found it with her, you know, they basically threw me out, right? I mean, she needed friends since it was the only friend that she had and she didn't want to lose her friend and she was, she had no idea the consequences that were coming. I had no idea the consequences that might happen. So they reported it to the cops and they think that was the right thing to do, right? Do you think it was the right thing to do? I have a hard time imagining at that point is angry and with the ability to isolate uh, that there was probably nothing far short of that that might have got my attention. So you seeing the calling the police was really an essential part of the intervention? I think it was. I really needed a solid intervention, something that really sort of a wake-up call. Nothing too me. subtle. Nothing too subtle, sledgehammer yeah. type of thing. Because, I mean, I really was isolation, Pow. right, and denial and my certainty that I'm on the path that I know what the hell I'm doing, right, because it's always been the path that I've been on. I figure it out. I've always figured it out. I'll figure it out. What do they call it? Hubris? Right. Overweening pride? Right. Yeah. You know, I just, I didn't have it because, I mean, I'd gotten, when, you know, 40 years down my life, down with practically no help. And what's funny is, at the same time, you've got all this pride, you're completely miserable. I'm completely miserable. Yeah. And, and there was all kinds of things. Frustration, anxiety, anger, um, guilt. I mean, I'm going to church at the time, you know? And so there's this guilt thing going on and all this sort of tension. All what kind time. of a church was it? It was pretty much a fundamentalist uh, Christian type of church. Can I ask, what was their reaction when this hit the papers? And I don't really know. I didn't talk to too many of them. I know that the pastor and the associate pastor visited me two times in the, in the prison. In prison, and they gave me a little bit of money. Uh, they they tell you you're welcome back whenever you get out. Or? Yeah, I mean that was the point. It really didn't turn out to be much. It's mostly talk. Oh, you know that thing. I when I got when I got out, I did go back, and because I was kicked out of my home, the home that we lived in, and that was a part of my plan to move back in there because in prison gave me an opportunity to kind of look at the things that were going wrong. I got a workbook, one of those ones that's fundamentally a repressionist type of uh, Oh, you're mom. jumping ahead to prison. Right, in prison, right. But it did have a couple of good things. It had a couple of tools for me to start thinking about some of my thinking areas and taking a personal inventory of uh, my strengths and weaknesses. And I really kind of found that I had no center, and I'm thinking about it, and I says, I'm really so unhappy in my job, right? I need to find something else to do. How long were you in prison? Probably 20 months altogether. Okay, so then you get out. What happens then? You're free as a bird or? No, I'm on lifetime supervision, which I didn't understand at the time when I signed off on it, that that was going to be like parole. So I'm a I'm parolee for as long as they want to keep me. But I'm under constant, I mean, if I want to travel, I have to get a pass. I, I have restrictions. I can't. Uh, without asking, go to a park. I can't go to a movie theater. Um, and of course, there's just a long list of can't do's. And with the counseling, I really think that it's given me some more tools. I started on my path in prison to figure this out. And I like to pride myself on being a very sane individual right now because I've had the opportunity to learn some things that the majority of the public don't understand. I mean, just things n not only sexually related, but related to a life, related to a man's life, uh, related to uh, just some mental sanity, thinking about who you are and what you're doing and the impact uh, of what's going on in your mind. Uh, it's one of the many unexpected blessings of this. Right. Wow. Okay. Thanks. This is a message for all of those who want to be a part of the solution on Tell Me About Your Sex Crime. We're interested in interviewing you. If you're a sex offender, if you're a victim, or if you're a family member of a sex offender, we would like to interview you for our show.